Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 98. Have you wanted to explore fractals and complex numbers in Python? Would you like to practice working with APIs in Python with a new project? This week on the show, Christopher Trudeau is here, and he's taking on the task of curating new issues of PyCoders Weekly going forward. He'll be joining me as a co-host every other week and bringing a fresh batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We discuss a real Python article about drawing the Mandelbrot set in Python. The tutorial guides you through creating fractal art using matplotlib and pillow. We also share a new step-by-step -step project building a weather reporting command line interface app. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a news roundup, a better Pi game main loop, working with static and media files in Django, and a library for pleasing console output. This episode is brought to you by CData Software, the easiest way to connect Python with data, SQL access to more than 250 cloud applications and data sources. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher. Welcome back. Hi there. It's good to have you on the show here. This is going to be a new trend for us going forward. We're going to talk PyCoders and news and projects every other week. At least that's kind of the plan going forward. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Cool. So one little wrinkle is we decided that maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's going on in Python news before we dive into some articles and projects. So my first one is talking about Black, the Python code formatter. We've mentioned it several times on the show up to this point. It is now... Uh, they consider it stable <laughs> and have uh, given it a no longer a beta product sort of stamp of approval. Version 22.1.0 is the version number that's up there right now. And it's the first non-beta release. And the first release that's, they have a new uh, stability policy that they have going. And a couple of highlights from some of the documentation, and I'll, I'll include some links for people that want to dive in further, is that they've removed Python 2 support. They introduced this thing, which is a dash dash preview flag, which allows you to try out new things that they're trying out. So the, I guess the idea is that under the stability policy, they would have the same code formatted with the same options will produce the same output ah. for all releases within a given year. So they're using feature flags and something that's only turned on if you configure it, but otherwise it's in the release. Yeah, and so the preview flag is exempt from the policy. Pretty much that's it. And the first release is in a new calendar year may contain formatting changes, although these will be minimized as much as possible. So yeah, it you know just becoming a much more sort of stable product and hence or stable project, I should say. And yeah, everybody I talk to uses it. So yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know, know many that don't. <laughs> I found the the announcement was kind of funny. It sort of reminded me of uh, Gmail. It was like, hey, we're in beta for two decades and now <laughs> right. it's in production. I'm like, yeah, everybody's been using black, you know, love it or hate it one way or the other for years now. And uh, yeah, oh, it's, oh, it's stable now. Okay, fine. Great. What were you doing to my code before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So what's your first story? Just a sort of quick little hit about Apple making some changes to what they're shipping. So for a long time, Apple shipped with Python right inside of Mac OS, and it was there for underlying support scripts. Yeah. And I think this is a historical thing because uh, Mac OS was originally had it has its roots in BSD. And so the problem is they've been shipping Python 2.7. That was there because of these support scripts, and they've never bothered to upgrade anything. So as of Monterey 12.3, which is currently in beta, uh, they've decided they're getting rid of it. 
this is great news for folks like myself who are on a Mac. I can't tell you the number of times I've forgotten to enable a virtual env and accidentally installed something in Python 2.7. So I would love to have it go, no, what Python? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it'll make it an awful lot easier. And then what they're doing is the Xcode toolkit, which is one of their standard bundles for developers and for like the Swift language and all that kind of stuff, has a lot of programming tools in it like Git and other things. So they're, they've been including an upgraded version of Python in that for a while now. I think they're on Python 3.8. So that will be the way to get it if you want to do it through the Apple channels, or you can do what most of us have been doing, which is just download it straight off Python or, or you know, use something like one of the packagers to install your Python. So uh, it's kind of uh, nice to see that this little foot gun is disappearing. Yeah. I think it's interesting that they're doing it mid cycle, if you will, not like on a major number, but that's great still. You know, I, I knew it was coming. The, the rumors had been there probably for the last year and a half, uh, talking about they were going to remove it. And, you know, I don't know how many people would, you know, always rely on, a, you know, a built in Python 2.7 outside of the Apple engineers using these older scripts that they <laughs> didn't want to rewrite or uh, older programs and stuff. So, yeah, it's good. And also probably more secure and, um, you know, generally forward progression. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah, it, it's always a bad sign when, you're, uh, when your production code is shipping something that isn't supported by the people who put it out there, right? So Yeah, totally. And it, this is sort of a trend. You're seeing it with a bunch of the Linux distributions as well that, uh, you know, they're slowly trying to get away from this. And uh, eventually we'll get to a place where 2.7 is, is a badge of shame rather than, oops, we're still there. Yeah. So my next one is a GitHub survey. Our, our little blurb for it was the GitHub survey on languages and more developer things, which I think is funny. The web address is octoverse.github.com. And yeah, 2021 state of the Octoverse, a huge survey that they took across millions of developers. You know, some of the numbers are kind of staggering when you kind of look at it. And there's just three charts in the main part that I want to talk about just briefly. The one was the top languages over the years. And the survey is going back as far as charting this from 2014. It's interesting to watch the languages kind of shuffle around to see things like Ruby kind of dropping from fifth place down to uh, from fifth to 10th. Python is now moved from fourth all the way up to second. JavaScript and TypeScript are both you know, high up there, JavaScript being the number one and has been stayed the number one for seven years here. And Java dropping down, we were one step above that. So again, that's one gauge is a, a survey like this and looking at the the commits and things like that are in GitHub. And then I like this one, which is real apropos of the times, uh, work before and after the pandemic and where respondents work before the pandemic and where respondents expect to work after the pandemic. And they have this term, they, they call it co-located, which means that you're in an office all the time or part-time, was 41% and now where they expect to be, 10%, which is a pretty shocking change. And a lot of that came from hybrid environments where it's like a mix of team members and an office or others remote, went from 28 to probably 47%, and then fully remote went from like 26 to 38. And that's an industry that, Again, our software industry is very much primed to be able to be remote, but a big sort of sea change over the last couple of years. And then the other area that's really interesting is documentation. They have a, a whole area talking about code that needs documentation to become a project. What repositories have a readme, <laughs> which ones don't? And then they have an open source number of like 14% of not having a readme with about 85% um, or 86% being with. And then work environments, um, open source at work is about the same, but work environments where it's just among the employees, very few readme files, only like 15.67% versus like 84% without it, which is, I guess that's what happens, right? Documentation has been a theme for us on, on the show. I find it as astounding, right? Like I've never been of the attitude that documentation is is something we have to do for other people. It's I don't remember what I did last week, and I need to document it for myself. So I, right. I tend to be obsessive compulsive about this stuff, not due to you know this being the right thing, but just because uh, you know I write enough code that I can't remember what I was doing a few weeks ago. 
I'm even surprised that he, even within the open source projects that the coverage isn't more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like such a significant, particularly when, you know, we, we're talking about GitHub here, right? Like it's a drop down automatically create readme. Yeah. It's there for <laughs> you. Right. And that's gotta be some of them. Right. So. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, so it's, it's a really comprehensive survey and there's lots of other areas to kind of focus on, but definitely should check it out. And then you can, if you don't want to, you know, spend time just perusing it on the web. You can download a PDF of the whole thing. Another kind of resource there. So we, I think we decided to group the next two news things kind of together. Yeah, the next two are both sort of release hits. The first one is that CPython 3.11 Alpha 5 has been released. This is the fifth of seven planned alpha releases. And of course, they're back on a yearly general schedule. So production release will come up in October. A couple key features for this release are better error information in the tracebacks. Nice. The ability to group exceptions, which I sort of thought, why would you do that? And the example they give is if you're trying to do retries on something and a different thing happens the second time than the first time, you can group them together. And then the other one that is there is uh, variadic generics, which I just like saying. It makes me feel smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, this is part of the type hint system, and it allows you to define uh, not just the types of a type, but the shape of a type. Hmm. So if you think of, let's say you're doing something with colors in pixels, you want to specify that it's a tuple that has three integers in it for the RGB values. You can actually specify that the type has to have those three things in it. Hmm. So interesting. Yeah. So I think there's, as with a lot of the type hinting, like it's gotten far enough along that they're looking at edge cases now when they add things in, but uh, they're, 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 they're making progress and trying to fill in those last few edges. So not only walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, but is shaped like a duck. <laughs> Flocks of ducks at this point. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, cool. What was the the Django one? And Django is uh, really just sort of a, a quick warning for folks. They've found a couple vulnerabilities that have been addressed. So there's been a security release. The patch fixes a potential cross-site scripting vulnerability with the debug template tag. There was a way of injecting stuff into a context variable, which would make it spit out stuff it wasn't supposed to. Mm. So there's patches for release 4, 3.2, and 2.2. So you should be on 4.0.2 if you can be. Yeah, I had a good conversation last week with Adam Johnson about Jinko stuff. And he's got a, a nice tool called Django Upgrade. It's kind of like Python Upgrade that um, or Update that you know kind of goes through your code and Make sure that it's ready to be updated to the latest versions and stuff. So another kind of quick shout out to his his project there and the developer experience stuff. Excellent. Diving into the main article area, this uh, article was kind of a little bit of a back and forth between, well, which of us want to talk about it? Because we both have done courses about Pygame. And your recent one was uh, making this Asteroids clone, which was very cool. And then mine was kind of a more fundamental one. And I'll include links to both of them if people are interested in diving into buy game a little bit. But it, the article is by Glyph. I don't know if he has a last name, just kind of goes by Glyph, probably most known as a Python dev who works on a project called Twisted, which is one of the earliest sort of async libraries that was out there, uh, you know, kind of focused on, on like web stuff. But he seems very interested in, in the, the game world and... <laughs> He's someone who's thought about event loops for a long time and spent years trying to like make them popular. He kind of talks about that in the article. And the article is titled A Better Pi Game Main Loop. When you create a, a Pi Game project or a game, there's this event loop that's always going to be there running in the background at all times, looking for things that have changed or things that need to be redrawn. And, and you can kind of set how that loop runs, what some beginners may do is just let it run as fast as the loop can. Um, and then you get kind of really weird kind of uh, frame rates, in my opinion. Sometimes they're like crazy fast because maybe your game doesn't have a lot of intense logic and will make the game just kind of speed a little too much. And there's lots of ways to control that. And we were talking beforehand about this, how you... Typically, you may want to set a timer in it to set it to something that's fairly regular, like 60 or maybe if you have a monitor that can do it 120 you know, frames per second or something like that to kind of keep it stabilized. 
And one when, when, one of the lessons in uh, in the course you mentioned there actually spends a whole bunch of time on sort of the difference between the frame rate and you know whether or not you move something every pixel and what looks smooth. Right. That, you know, can, should, can I move it by two pixels? I can get away with that. If I move it by three, it starts to jump. And depending on what your frame rate is, it looks smooth or it doesn't look smooth. So this is an important part of making your game look a little more professional. Yeah, and that's you know that's the thing. Like a lot of people getting into this, hence why game engines are kind of a more popular way to approach games in some ways with something like pie game you're, you are getting down at a much more intensive level and actually able to modify the loop itself and, and choose the order of operations and 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 that's part of like what this gets into is as you want to design something that's maybe a more complex game and maybe isn't just uh, graphics in it, you know, maybe like an arcade style type of game, you might need to call out to a network. And network calls, in this case, could block the forward momentum of like updating your drawing inside the game. And so you'll end up with kind of interesting things where the timing gets out and you get like vertical sync errors where like part of the frame has been redrawn before you've, refreshed it and Pi game 2 added a thing called vsync which is an option that you can turn on now and just really quickly that vertical synchronization eliminates this sort of tearing that can happen of like part of the frame is being refreshed and like maybe the top half of the screen is like in a different position than the bottom half it looks really bad you've probably seen it in games before and sort of weird artifacts but it, it'll eliminate it by having the timing buffer fill coincide with the vertical blanking interval basically the in between frame thing and, and to just make sure that we're just getting whole frames on the screen at one time so the crux of the article is he implements a new loop and shows an example of it and it's using async and await to handle what i consider additional things in the game that would normally be susceptible to blocking like maybe not working calls or maybe it's an intensive game, game AI thing or some other kind of, you know, events that might potentially cause this sort of like, all right, I guess we've got to wait for that to happen <laughs> kind of thing. And then continue to update and draw the graphics and flip at what would be like a regular interval. He also has links to another article that he made a demo of, which is using his own Twisted Framework. Twisted is the name of it. <laughs> and uh, But this article is showing... It using actual standard library stuff. So again, if you're interested in Pi Game, and if you've ever had problems and said, "Okay, I want to you know get a nice, clean, smooth looking frame rate," and I'm interested in also potentially adding elements that could create blocking type of code, um, this is a a nice way to kind of look at it and and dives pretty deep. It, it's hard to get too far into it without it getting really technical and and very Pi Game specific. One of the things that I kind of liked about this is without asynchronous weight, like one of the things that you can always do is try to put this on a separate thread, but then you've got coordination problems. And the technique that he uses here is on the coroutine that does the graphics display at the bottom, it does an await on the coroutine that does everything else. So, uh, and this, again, this stops the tearing. Now it, it may still slow down your frame rate. Cause if you're, if your other thing takes too long and, it, and you can't get it processed in time, then you're going to drop frames, but at least this way you're dropping the entire frame instead of say half the frame, mm. which is the problem that he was trying to solve. Yeah. The, the only thing that I wasn't, uh, that wasn't entirely clear on and haven't, uh, haven't looked into yet. And maybe you drop this part out of the podcast, Chris, if you don't know the answer, but uh, do, do, you, do you know the difference between the V-Sync and the clock? I don't, as far as like, I, I know that the V-Sync flag, he's implementing kind of both, you know, he's saying, okay, turn V-Sync, I think it's a value of like one to basically, you know, true, turn it on. And then I, that's doing something, I think, behind the scenes. In his example, he sets the the frame rate to like a value that you can kind of change. But if you don't adjust that, it, he's setting it to like infinity as fast as it can go. Okay. <laughs> Which I think is kind of interesting, um, and and his example, his example has 120 uh, going, which is okay. I don't know of many like arcade style games where people are using 120. Um, maybe it's becoming more standard as we go, but 
Oh, you're you're obsessive PC gamers that uh, buy the high end graphics cards. Like trying to do that all the time. It's a it's a bit of a badge of honor, I think. Yeah, I, I found this really nice resource though. Kind of going through the site and links that he was sharing. It, it went to a Pi Game book uh, titled Pi Game Four Thousand, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting name for it. It's a little older. I think it's maybe kind of been an ongoing project that this person's been adding and more more and more stuff to it and i'll include a link to it but it had lots of game examples which that's always helpful for me to see how people are implementing the stuff and and putting it in place just kind of getting a variety of these techniques is really nice and then the stuff that i'm interested in very often with frameworks like this is like you know, again, I'm a sound guy. So, like, what are ways to implement sound properly or in a way that's effective? One of the projects I've thought about doing for a while is like a graphic visualizer, like a thing that, you know, kind of like a music synthesizer, visualizer kind of thing that used to be popular. I don't know of what ones that are popular right now, but creating one in, in Pi Game is something that I think you could find it as a good platform for doing that. And then there's an area about MIDI and a few others. And so there's lots of interesting sort of connections. You know, not only is it the book with lots of examples, but like code examples, and then kind of like a small, small-ish awesome list that has lots of additional links for you to kind of go off of. And it was like a whopping $3 to, to get this book. So I, I, I did that and did my PSF uh, additional donation via PayPal. <laughs> so Excellent. Skip a, skip a latte and buy a programming book. That seems like a good deal. CData software. Connect, integrate, and automate your data from Python or any other application or tool. At CData, we simplify connectivity between all of the applications and data sources that power business, making it easier to unlock the value of data. Our SQL-based connectors streamline data access, making it easy to access real-time data from on-premise or cloud databases, SaaS, APIs, NoSQL, and Big Data. Check out cdata.com to learn more. Cool. So what's your first one here, first article? Uh, so that, yeah, the uh, next one we're going to talk about is about drawing Mandelbrot sets in Python. It's an article by Bartosz Dzicinski, and it talks about how to draw the Mandelbrot set. So you've probably, even if you don't know the name, you've probably seen these before. It's pretty math pr- pictures is what it comes down to. The Mandelbrot set is part of fractal geometry, and all of that is part of chaos theory in mathematics. This is an idea in math uh, that kind of came about in the 1970s and 80s as people were doing uh, research in the weather, uh, interestingly enough. Hmm. And this was using patterns of equations. Where, and it turns out that these are things where in most equations, if you make a small change to the input, you get a small change to the output. And in chaos theory equations, you make a small change to the input and you get a huge change to the output or varying unpredictable changes, hence the chaos name. The common idea that most people know is what's called the butterfly effect, not just a mediocre movie from Ashton Kutcher, although somebody must have liked it. They made two sequels. (laughs) This is the idea that, you know, a a butterfly flaps its wings in Japan and a hurricane shows up in uh, in Louisiana. And and this is because that small perturbation of the the flapping of the wings affects the weather and, and, and accumulates over time. So one of the first things in chaos theory was something called the Lorenz attractor. And these were, again, this small variation made changes to the equation, but they would loop back on themselves. So they made these sort of pretty swirl kind of diagrams. So all this is part of the fractal piece and and the math behind it usually involves complex numbers which are numbers that include a component where the square root of negative one is involved. And Mandelbrot himself was a mathematician who worked for IBM and used all that new computing power in the 1980s and used it to try and figure out how to uh, compute these values inside of the Mandelbrot set. And this kind of tells you how far things have come, right? Because he was using these massive mainframes and now you can do this on your phone. (laughs) Yeah, right. So the Mandelbrot sets themselves are a collection of numbers. They're infinitely repeating patterns. And what ends up happening is when you look at one of the images that describes it, if you zoom in on one part of the image, you'll find things that look like the whole picture. 
So the example that often gets talked about here is like a coastline. So if you think of the coastline from space, it's got sort of a jagged little form. And then if you zoom into the human level, you look at like just what's in front of you. It's again, it's got a little bit of a jagged little form. And then if you looked at like crab level and the nooks and crannies of, of, of the sand, it's got that same jagged little form. You've got these patterns. And because of this kind of thing, what ends up happening is these are used a lot in computer games to generate realistic looking clouds and trees Yeah, because it just takes a tiny bit of math and then you can do it rather than having to, you know, try to paint it. Yeah. The idea of this sort of procedural generation of backgrounds and, and other things like I'm sure that's being used in, I hear that game, No Man's Sky. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Same. Yeah. But yeah. So I'm sure this kind of stuff is in there for sure. So the Mandelbrot set itself is essentially a collection of numbers, and you have two equations, uh, a collection of equations, and the one essentially is a, a square plus a constant of the previous value. So the, each, each element in the series is calculated based on the previous element, and you're squaring it and adding a constant. And if the number that you use for the constant every single time in that instance, if the resulting number in the formula is bounded, which means it doesn't keep growing, then that number, the constant, is in the Mandelbrot set. Mm. So if you think of, you know, if we just take a number like one and stick it into this and you square it and then you, you know, take that value and then you square it and you take that value and you square it and you keep adding one, what happens is, you know, you you get a one digit number and a two digit number and a five digit number. It doesn't take long till you've got a 46 digit number and you quickly guess that one isn't a member of the Mandelbrot set because this thing's going to keep growing. But because complex numbers have the square root of negative one in them, when you square them, you end up with these things that oscillate between a positive number and a negative number. And so you're adding something, then subtracting something. You're adding something, then subtracting something. So those kinds of numbers end up having bounds on them. And if there is a bound, then that's part of the Mandelbrot set. So you essentially what you want to do when you're programming this is spit a whole bunch of numbers into it and then try to figure out whether or not they're bounded inside of the equations. And if so, that's part of your Mandelbrot set. And what the article then does is take that simple concept of is this number in or isn't this number in? And then once you've done that, starts plugging stuff into NumPy in order to create a big matrix of those kinds of values so that you can evaluate on each value whether it's a part of the set or not a part of the set. And then once you've got that matrix, you take that and try to graph it. And he goes through three or four different ways of graphing it, a couple of them with matplotlib and just like does a simple little scatter plot. And then, and that gives you like a really sort of low res visualization that you can sort of see the outline of the pretty bubbles that Mandelbrot usually has. And then goes more complicated doing color maps and then starts sticking stuff into pillow and colorizing them and not just taking the numbers, but making them beautiful. So it, it really does sort of, it's got a bit of the math in it. And then it takes you through each of the steps in how to sort of turn that into something that you could print into a very pretty poster and hang on your dorm room wall, for example. Right. <laughs> yeah. I I was thinking in the background that, that, why hasn't but somebody created a, a line of ties that <laughs> have Mandelbrot and Julia sets on them? Oh, it's um, got to be out there. I bet, yeah. <laughs> I'd be very surprised if it isn't. Neil deGrasse Tyson always seems to has, have an entire collection of universe ties on it, so there's got to be some mathematician out there doing it, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, one of these really in-depth real Python, you know, Let's dive into a topic and, and get really deep into it. So I, I like that uh, that we have those. Yeah, and, and it's got a nice, like, even if you're not into the math side of it, right? There's a little bit of the math. There's a little bit of complex numbers. There's a little bit of NumPy. There's a little bit of Matplotlib and Pillow. So even if you don't care about, uh, you know, how to generate the sets, you can sort of plug that in and use it as a, a learning tool to use one of those. right. Uh, even if you don't care about the sets, you can use that to plug it into the other parts to as a learning tool for one of those libraries. Yeah, yeah, the idea of like uh, you know mapping colors across that and and those kinds of things. Yeah, cool. Exactly. So my second one is from Edamar Turner Trowing, former guest. He has a blog. It's called Python Speed. We've talked about it several times in the in the past. This one is kind of timely. An, a new feature came along in Pandas version 1.4 uh, that allowed for a 
new library to be used for reading CSVs. And so the title of it is called The Fastest Way to Read a CSV in Pandas. One of the problems with CSV reading is that it has generally been single-threaded and depending on the size of your <laughs> CSV file, could be pretty slow. And I know a lot of people, you know, having my own background of working with a real mix of departments that I worked with in a bank and at this marketing area that I would get files, lists of CSVs, I would get SQL data in, I'd get a real whole mix of different things. And so sometimes I would be reading, again, really large things in. And so I found this interesting, and it's fairly short, but the article covers timing these methods of reading stuff in. He's got a really big data set that I think was around 800 megabytes or something like that. And he shows like the default CSV performance, and then a much faster, more parallel CSV reading using this thing called Pi Arrow, which again is introduced in version 1.4. One thing that's a little missing there is that if you just add the use this new engine, the engine equal pair, Pi Arrow, as you put it in there, it will let you know that, that that it's separate. You do need to pip install Pi Arrow also. That's just one word altogether. P-Y Arrow, A-R-R-O-W. Once you've done that, then he's using the time module where you can just Literally, as you're going to run this very simple script, you know, time, space, Python, and then the name of the the script that you're running, and it'll output and show you, like, okay, what's the real overall time versus, like, the user in the system. But it also will give you an idea of, at least on my run of it, was, like, showing me how much of the CPU it was actually using. The article dives into that pretty deep, and you can kind of learn about it. He also has a separate article on, on timing. I tried it out with a very small library that was more around 19 megabytes. And I did still see a difference in it once I had gotten it installed. You know, a very small difference because it's in like, you know, few you know portions of a second. And then the article goes a little further into it in saying that, you know, CSVs are pretty inefficient as far as the, the size of them. Uh, you could probably, if you're going to deal with this type of data often, and you have the opportunity to compress it down. There's a format that also is sort of part of the library, or at least works with it uh, in PyArrow called Parquet, spelled P-A-R-Q-U-E-T. And Parquet, you can basically output from Pandas in this Parquet format. And it really shrunk the file that I had down quite a bit. He didn't mention that that it is doing a form of compression to it. But it took my 19 megabyte file and, and put it down to 2.3 megabytes. And the original zip that I downloaded off the internet for this file to kind of play with was really close to that. It's like 1.7. So that format then can be read in using another method called fast parquet. Again, if you want to play with this, you do need to pip install that too. <laughs> so you need to pip install fast parquet to play with that stuff. But these techniques could, if you're daily reading in CSVs, really speed up the time. Again, if it's a one-off, this is probably not worth the effort. But if it's something where you're you know, constantly doing it, like a, maybe it's a pipeline and you're getting data from multiple sources and they're coming in a CSV and that kind of common processing task, then this will at least take advantage of your, your computer's threads and, and process the, the data a little quicker for you. And <laughs> as you mentioned when we were going over these articles initially, the final paragraph is probably the best paragraph of the whole thing, that the best CSV is no CSV. <laughs> yeah. Because it's kind of a bad format for data. Yeah, I, I like the honesty of it, right? And here's here's several pages of how to do this, and then try not to. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, if yeah. You can, yeah. It, yeah, CSVs are really inefficient. You know, not only the size that I was mentioning before, but they're just inefficient to parse because there's no types in them at all. It, literally, it's just comma-separated values. And that can really lead to a lot of error-prone kind of stuff and ambiguous kind of processes as things import. If you know a lot about the data that you're getting in, then maybe you can. But the guesses that a, a program or even pandas will try to make uh, very often will be wildly inconsistent. And so anyway, yeah, it's not a, a great format if you can 
work with other stuff. Not only is it a fairly large, uncompressed format, it also does is missing much of anything that you would want in data science to to work with. But they're common. <laughs> Yeah, and there's some variations on it as well. So depending on what reader you're doing, how it deals with things like quoted commas and that kind of stuff, yeah. do or don't work. So it, it can be problematic if you're trying to uh, join data from different sources, because uh, some of them might have been output by Excel and some of them might have been output by something else. And they might, although they're all technically just comma separated, they may not actually be compatible. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting too. Like, can be such a weird kind of thing that you run into, you know. 80% of the work in data science is making sure your data is ready. <laughs> yeah, I'd be surprised if the number wasn't significantly higher than that. Yeah, depending on how it's going. Yeah. Yeah. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It touches on one of the topics in this episode and could work as a starting point if you're interested in exploring games with Python. It's titled Make a 2D Side Scroller Game with Pygame. The course is based on an article by previous guest John Fincher, and in the course, yours truly takes you through how to draw items on your screen, how to play sound effects and music and handle user input, how to implement event loops, and it describes how game programming is different from standard procedural Python programming. I think game programming is a great way to get familiar with object-oriented programming, and it's a fun way to practice your Python skills. Plus, you get a project that you can share. Like most of the video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. You get code examples for the techniques shown, and all courses have a transcript including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. So what do you got next? Uh, so the next one is an article from Amal Shaji uh, talking about working with the different file types, uh, static and media files in Django. So this is, uh, he, it's pretty exhaustive. He, he goes through everything and not only the dev variations, but the production variations and all the rest of that. So Django is, you know, it's a, you know, one of the more popular web frameworks and it kind of divides, and this isn't really unique to Django, but this sort of divides the concepts of, I've got the HTML that I'm spitting out from Django. I've got things like the images on the page that are linked to in that HTML and stuff like the CSS and the JavaScript, all that kind of good stuff. And then I've got user uploads. Yeah. So when you deploy a Django server, your best strategy is to just have it deploy only the HTML and then have things like the CSS and the JavaScript come from something else like Apache or Nginx. And this is an efficiency thing. Uh, Apache and Nginx are going to be much better at spitting these out. And of course, you can use things like CDNs and stuff like that for this static content, which you can't with the dynamic content of the HTML. So the article talks about how Django manages these different things, how you can interact with them on the Django development server versus how you can use the Django uh, command line tools to push them off to production servers, different ways of mapping that to places like Nginx in order to deal with it. You want to serve things like your CSS and JavaScript from something like Nginx because it's a lot faster, it's a lot safer, uh, and this is just sort of the best way to do things. And then there's a third category, which is file uploads. So think of, let's say you were building a, you know, a, a, the world's simplest social media site. You've got pages that get displayed, you've got the logo for your social media site, and then I want to be able to upload pictures for to share with my friends. Well, those uploaded pictures aren't static and they aren't that HTML being spit out by Django. So you have to do something different with these. Django itself refers to this as media files. And so it's got a third mechanism for dealing with media files. You want to put them in their own directory so that if somebody uploads something malicious, it uh, protects your regular code. Mm. And so all of this, again, has to be wired into either Apache or Nginx and uh, all that kind of stuff in order to get all these pieces working together so the article does a really good job of sort of going through all of this and uh, and walks you through the different scenarios and, and talks about how all the parts fit together 
The only thing that I was kind of missing here, which if you're really, really interested in this is worth sort of Googling off on its own, is uh, it didn't get into the idea of I want to upload a file, but put permissions on it so that Django has to say, can Mr. Bailey see this before it hands it off to Nginx? Uh Uh, It just deals with the public part. And there are hooks in uh, Django and Nginx to be able to say, okay, he's got permission and now hand it off to Nginx. And if you set some headers correctly, you can do that as well. So except for that tiny little piece, the article covers everything else really, really well. So you're saying that it could be a security thing that people could potentially work around a way to to see stuff if you're not setting it up properly that they could get to the media files. Uh well yeah so so essentially there's well with everything if you know the URL unless you've put permissions in front of that URL you can get at it. So the default mechanism with with the media files is they usually get hosted under URL slash media. So if I upload it and put that uh, file in there, if you know the URL, you can get it. There's no blocker on it. And so you're essentially, you're just putting it in a place that Nginx or Apache can serve it. So there is a another a third way of essentially controlling the URL that Nginx won't serve it unless you go through Django first. And Django basically says, yes, he can see this. So okay. In the, the article covers public static and public media. It doesn't cover private media. Okay. Yeah, there seems to be a good article at the bottom also in the recommended there uh, about maybe putting some of the stuff on Amazon S3, which I've, I've heard of people doing quite a bit. Yes, and, and again, that, that's another alternative to hosting an Apache or Nginx, right? And that's essentially the sort of that CDN mode, right? Like, let's put it somewhere where it can be uh, cached and hosted. Yeah, awesome. I, that's it's always been a question for me and always seemed a little confusing. This is clarifying some of it for me. So that's nice. Yeah. And Django can be a little picky. So the the development server, although there, you can make it serve these things easily enough in your development environment, it doesn't come out of the box that way. Uh, So there's a couple extra lines of code you have to put in like your Earl's file or whatever in order to get that to work. Uh, So, so not just the production stuff is there, but also how, how do I do this in my dev and how do I make sure I don't accidentally do this in production, right? So how do you you know, put the hook on it that says, are you in debug mode? And if not, don't do this. Uh, so, <laughs> right. uh, you know, a, a nice, safe way of, of tackling it. Yeah, cool. So that moves us into projects. And my project is a, a pretty large one. And so I'll probably spend a little more time kind of diving into it. But I, I really wanted to share it because uh, it shows so many things that I think are kind of missing in a lot of step-by-step projects. It is a real Python step-by-step project. This one's by Martin Broyce, previous multi-time guest, I guess, friend of the show. I just kind of want to go over the things you get to practice. It's titled Raining Outside, Build a Weather CLI App with Python. I, I think it's a really useful in the way that I don't know who who isn't interested in the weather, you know? There are tons of things that you get to practice your Python on. Number one, the process of getting an API key, managing secrets. Uh, You're going to use a tool called Config Parser for that in this tutorial. Working with APIs, actually making different forms of API calls from a script. Parsing JSON. You're going to practice command line interface building with arg parse. Along with that, you're going to spend a lot of time on the output deciding what are the things that you want to show, again, kind of parsing that JSON, but also what are ways that you could maybe make it a little more attractive to the user or the person reading this. And so you get to work with F-strings and a whole bunch of other stuff with formatting text and advanced text manipulation, all the way into things like ANSI color codes and emojis and stuff like that. I had fun doing this. <laughs> so it was a, definitely a, a fun little bit of time I spent yesterday kind of going through it. It didn't take me too long to get things up and running. The API key that you use is from Open Weather, And they're pretty generous as far as the things that you get to, to use with it for a free, you know, just setting up an account with them. You can get, I mean, they go to full-on you know, very elaborate stuff. If you were going to make a full on weather app, um, there are levels of the API that you can kind of pay for that you can get into. I think that this is a, a fantastic practice project for so many things in Python. You get to practice 
making really good dock strings, which is something I don't see in a lot of tutorials. I, I really like that. It, it goes not only into explaining like what you know this particular function is doing, but also that it's showing a bit of the type information and how that should probably be formatted and ways to do that. There's a lot of step-by-step -step iteration uh, with output as you go and testing the project as you go, which is, I think, really nice for teaching you iterating and, and working through a project as you build it and sort of manually testing it. He adds error handling and try accept blocks, which again is something that sometimes just gets skipped over in tutorials, but definitely makes your project look a lot more approachable to someone who's a little more established as a developer and, and understanding, you know, errors and things that are not working properly and kind of proper messaging behind that. Again, that API is really robust. Like it outputs stuff and he's using it, using a, uh, an endpoint that is asking for like a city name specifically. And <laughs> the library of city names is kind of insane. It, it accepts a, a huge number. I think it's like 200,000 cities or something like that. But you can, if you wanted to modify this, you could do it by zip code. Like maybe you live in the US and you want to get something a little more localized like that, or you can actually do it with longitude and latitudes. And I can think of you taking this project much further beyond just a command line thing. As a command line thing, you could add something like rich or textual to make it like a TUI, or you could turn it into a GUI, one of these kind of more advanced user interfaces, or go on and make it into like a, a mobile thing or framework beyond just the idea of like you could add testing and hosting and packaging. These are things that are not really covered in detail, but it's a project that really lends itself to, to doing those things. And then uh, again, like you could change the parameters and say, oh, I want to see more than just temperature because what it spits out, it you know shows like humidity, the temperatures, um, depending on <laughs> the default format is Kelvin, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. And the numbers coming out of it initially were kind of shocking. <laughs> but you can modify to show Imperial, you know, Fahrenheit if you want, if you're US based. And um, generally, yeah, again, you could pull out all the kinds of other weather data from it. So uh, a neat project for you to play with. Uh, not very long to get set up and, and working with it. And I think it'll probably spark a bunch of light bulbs for people that have wanted to kind of dabble with Python and APIs and haven't had a, a solid resource to to work with. Um, and this is a really good one. Yeah, I, I find stuff like this is is really, really important. Like the, there really isn't enough out there. I, I find when I'm teaching, you, know, you sort of start with the hello world and, you know, and everything is sort of play problems. And then, yeah. and the internet's filled with all sorts of stuff on that. And then there's all sorts of things out there about, you know, how to use meta classes to do, you know, something extremely complicated, which no one ever will even think about doing except for the most hardcore cases. Right. And how to get from one to the other is is often a challenge. There's a couple of people that I used to uh, uh, to teach, trying to get them to a place where that they understood the coding, and but they never were able to sort of figure out well, well, what, how do I solve this problem, and and how do I think about those pieces and how they fit together. So having a good example of oh, okay, well now I do this, and now oh, okay, now I'll add arc parse and all those pieces uh, can be very very useful for folks. Yeah, yeah, it's and again, it's a great example of of playing with those things and i think you could translate it to you know other cli tools or other stuff like that but it, it uh <laughs> i don't know like i said it, it, sometimes i do these tutorials like when i was working with david a lot on on these articles and sometimes it was a real chore to go through them and i was having to scratch my head often as there were like leaps <laughs> that i was supposed to make with the, the author that you know that wasn't written and this one really doesn't do that which i think is great and it it, it really is Definitely in the name, step by step. So excellent, cool. What's your project? So this one's a, a, a short little library that came across that I thought was kind of cool. Developed by somebody named Robert Grimm, and it's a toolkit for some logging stuff. Okay, I like Python. It's uh, one of my go-to languages, uh, but every language has those things in it where you're like, oh, I wish they did that differently. Uh, and for me, logging is that inside of Python. Um, and I know why it's done that way. It's very configurable and it allows you to, you know, which makes it very, very powerful. But most times when I'm trying to debug something, I just end up using print because configuring the logger and get everything going to standard out and all the rest of it, there's all these steps you have to go through. Yeah. And if you miss one of them, it, you know, it's like, where did it go? Where, 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 okay, I've created a log file where did that end up 
So this is a library called Console, spelt with a K, and it's a wrapper to the logger. So it, it's above and beyond, and it essentially just wraps things into standard out. So if you want to use the logger but uh, and the concepts of like debug or info or error and those kinds of ideas, but don't want to have to bother setting all this up and you're good with, let's just set this out to the terminal, this does it. And it supports coloring. So, uh, of course, you're on the terminal. Most terminals nowadays have that whole, you know, ANSI 256 thing going on. So this allows you to see different boldings of the messages and it color codes like debug versus warn versus error. If you want to provide a stack trace, if you happen to be inside of an accept block, it'll color code that as well to make it easier. So it's uh, it, it's one of those that's sort of like, It's easy enough to just sort of do a pip install and and get it going, but can and isn't particularly complicated, but does help. It can be very helpful when you're when you're going through your debug process. It reminds me an awful lot of like the output from things like Django or Flask on the in their dev servers, right? That is sort of that color coded concept, and it's all built in, uh, so you don't have to go figuring out how to do that for yourself. Yeah, it looks like it's an involved project. Lots of. uh... Lots of updates to it within the last several days too, and that's always nice to see too, right? It's uh, you, you, yeah. the things are maintained. You, you higher chance that it'll work with your most recent whatever you're doing. Awesome. Well, Christopher, thanks so much for coming on the show and talking with me and uh, sharing all these PyCoders uh, articles and projects. Pleasure. Looking forward to next time. All right. Don't forget, you can get simple cloud data connectivity to SaaS, big data, and NoSQL from Pandas, SQL Alchemy, Dash, and Petal. Learn more at cdata.com. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.